Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, feel free to take a seat. We've got about 90 minutes, and for those 90 minutes, I will be your humble moderator. Um, today, we'll be talking about how creativity is driving innovation, um, specifically how creativity shouldn't be held within or isn't no longer held within a department or within a group, but creativity being used in all of its ways whether it's the, the simplest way of seeing data in a new way or connecting dots differently, and how we can be creative to drive innovation. Um, and I'd like to welcome the panel up here, um, people who are really going to uh, sh shine and bring this to life. We have Debbie Lang, who is marketing manager, uh, pet care for um, Mars in New Zealand. We have John Scott, who is CEO of Drinkwise Australia. Mike Hauser who is Digital Marketing Manager for Visit Victoria, and Sam Cofield, who is Senior Manager for Road Safety at TAC. Uh, please welcome them. <clears throat> so this is how this is gonna roll. We've got 90 minutes. Um, in that time, you know, I've actually cornered each of the speakers or the panelists, and you know, we've spoken separately and together. And we felt like we really wanted to shed more light on the beautiful mess of innovation. You know, we have all of this new technology and all of these tools, but those things alone aren't driving innovation. It's how we use them, how we combine and recombine them. Um, but more importantly, the journey of how we get there, there is no standardization, there is no right or wrong way. Um, and we find this incredibly emotional, incredibly powerful journey that sort of, you know, uh, we, we all go on to get there. And if there are any people in the room who, um, who do any sort of work in innovation or have been a part of a team that's innovated before, you know what I'm talking about. It's sloppy, but it's wonderful. It's emotional, it's, uh, and, and it's, an, it's an incredible journey. And we really wanted to spend some time exploring that and how creativity plays a role in, in getting there. Um, so what I've asked each panelist to sort of think through um, is how creativity in their own way has powered some of their solutions and what they've done to, to get there. So we're going to start out by showing a quick video just to give you all some context about who we have up on stage, the work that they've done, and I've asked them each to just sort of talk through the project, um, the process a little bit, and how creativity in their, from their perspective has helped drive the, the experience. So without further, A platform that targets young Australians needs to talk to them wherever they are, be it here, 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 or even here. The campaign that famously broke the rules by saying drink properly instead of don't drink broke them again by going where no brands dare to go. Snapchat, the underworld of social media, hardly the place for a traditional responsible drinking message, but the perfect place for ours. Using existing platform channels, we encouraged young Aussies to subscribe to us for content too fucked for Facebook, too insane for Instagram, but with a message as important as ever. If the slab to chip ratio of your trolley is over 50-50, you're headed for Chundertown. You could use the chips to soak the vomit from the carpet or swap a few slabs for water. In just six weeks, thousands of snaps were received by subscribers who opted to follow us giving each and every one of them some valuable drinking tips and a much needed break from dick pics. Wow, uh, different than you'd expect from a, you know, a, a, an organization like Drinkwise. So John, talk a little bit about you know, the process of how you got there and sort of you know, how creativity might have played a role, not just in the end result, but in, in the way you got there and, what sort of, and how it helped drive innovation. Um, Gavin, I think when we go back to February 2014 and we look as a board and as an organisation at that cohort of 18 to 24 year olds, we recognise that they were the one cohort in Australia that weren't changing their drinking habits, they were still drinking excessively. And we'd probably seen about 20 years of government style campaigns telling 18 to 24 year olds, you know, the negative impacts of drinking in poor ways. And not surprisingly, when we went out and spoke to young people about that, those messages just weren't resonating for them. So a real dilemma for our board to take on something that nobody had managed to crack in terms of how do you actually get a message to 18 to 24 year olds 
that resonates with them and actually gets them to think about moderation. There's an element of risk to doing that because we knew that if nobody had done it, you know, there were, we were up against it. Um, but I think the, the genesis of why How to Drink Properly has, has really made an impact is because we actually went out and listened to 18 to 24 year olds. We did lots of ethnographic work, we did lots of segmentation, a lot of formative research, we sat in bars with 18 to 24 year olds, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, <laughs> we uh, listened to their stories, but more importantly, that allowed us to glean some fantastic insights about social and how it so much determines how they organize their week, almost their drinking journey from a Wednesday night and how they, how they use social to connect to their peer group, right through to preloading and the phenomenon of preloading where they're drinking at somebody's house on a Friday or Saturday night, right through to what we call, you know, Sunday morning and that, that oh shit moment where you reach for your phone because you don't know what you posted <laughs> on social media the night before. So by doing that, I think that was the genesis of some innovation with this campaign that's really turned a responsible drinking message on its head by appealing to this notion of classiness, that you can drink in a classy, sophisticated way. And I think um, that's involved a level of risk both for the board, for the executive, um, in terms of how that's been seen by the Australian community outside of the target audience. But I think it's, it's, it's a great example of putting a lot of emphasis on research to, to actually say what was working before wasn't working with this, this age group. Let's mix it up, let's mm. look at it differently. Mm. So it was a different kind of research. I mean, you approached it just from a, a very different perspective. Not that, you know, 18 to 24 drink year old drink fests. I mean, that sounds a lot of fun. I'd be into that. But that's something you guys have never been done, had done before. Really getting under the hood, spending time with your audience in the way that they go about drinking or socializing, right? Absolutely. And I mean, we could have lo just looked at government statistics, which just would have mirrored to us what we already knew, that they were drinking excessively. It wasn't telling us anything new about that audience, the role of social in their lives, the role of preloading, um, and how we could potentially map their journey over a week and actually target messages at the right time and as we saw there through a whole range of different tactics, get to them in different ways at different times. Cool. Hold that thought on risk because it's something I really want to come back to and I think some, something that everybody on the panel can you know, relate to. Um, so hold that. Um, let's see who's up next. Last year, 249 people died on our roads. What would be a more acceptable number? Acceptable? 70, maybe? Actually, this is what 70 people looks like. It's my family. So, now, what do you think would be a more acceptable number? Zero. Zero. While we've come a long way, we'll always make mistakes. But with safer cars, roads, speeds and people, can we can change road safety for good.
reality check, showing the true cost of drink driving by printing it on your receipt. Boots could make all the difference in an accident and these socks could help you choose a pair of the right height. If your boots don't come up to this line, you're risking your feet. The idea is you have just something that changes the texture of the door handle so that every time you grab the door handle to open the car door, it reminds you a cyclist may be coming up behind you. If it can save a life or save someone's face, that's well worthwhile. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Can you talk a little bit about the SAM and the, the journey you went on? Yeah. Um, our, our journey's actually been quite a long one. Uh, although we only la launched this campaign late last year, in fact, it, it probably took us almost a decade to convince our own executives, um, and we're a government organisation, so our ministers, etc., that we'd almost gone as far as we could with the traditional approach. And for most people, the traditional approach, the more shocking, more emotive approach that we've been taking wasn't broken. And in fact, it wasn't. We were doing okay, but that's all we were doing. Um, Victoria was well known for road safety internationally. We had many firsts. We were the first to introduce seatbelt wearing. We were the first to have uh, random breath testing, the first to have booze buses, the first to have drug testing. But we pretty much come to the end of where behaviour change, where individual behaviours being changed uh, could reduce road trauma on our roads. And at the TAC, we had this goal of one day seeing zero people being killed and seriously injured on our roads. The story of convincing our CEOs, our ministers, wasn't too difficult. We had the luxury of time. We had the luxury of big, thick documents with lots of evidence. Yeah. Once we got them across the line, it was then how do we convince the Victorian community? The community thought everything was going okay. Uh, there was no demand. Nobody was knocking on my door saying, Sam, you're not doing a good enough job. People thought it was okay. A few less people died every year. It was okay that 240, 250 people were dying. So we had to change it. We had to convince them that nobody should be killed or seriously injured on our roads. I think the two key insights that we used were that uh, people didn't think it was achievable. So we knew one of the things we had to do was convince them. And the reason they didn't think it was achievable was A, people do stupid, risky things, and B, people make mistakes. And particularly the mistakes were what we considered couldn't be, that they considered couldn't be changed. Um, the other thing I think is that they felt there was inevitability about the road toll. To have a modern, efficient transport system, some people had to die. And the insight there was some people, not my mum, not my dad, not my kids, not my friends, not my colleagues, other people. And it was about saying, no, no, all of the people who die are somebody's mum, somebody's dad, somebody's sister, brother. So uh, the campaign evolved really to be one of, of personalisation, changing road toll from being about numbers to about being about people, and then to some degree about uh, being about immunisation, actually telling people, yeah, actually, we know people make mistakes. Um, we know that people do risky things. And actually, what we're going to do now is design the system around them. Great. I love that uh, notion of evolution, you know, that sort of step change that you moved into from some of those insights. Um, what I'm curious about, too, are um, some of those artifacts that were created, the, the handle for the doors, yeah. that, you know. Um, how, did, how did that come about? Where, where, where was that driven from? Yeah. So one of the things, of course, for us is gently nudging people into the right behaviour. And um, thanks to uh, all credit to the CLEMS team, this wasn't something we briefed in, it wasn't something we were particularly looking to do, but there'd been quite a lot of media around what we call car dooring, 
And certainly, as cycling has increased, we're seeing more car drawing, particularly in inner suburban areas. And um, totally proactive uh, idea from Clems. But, you know, the insight was we just needed a nudge. We didn't need to be hammered over the head. We just needed a, a gentle idea that would remind us. And uh, it's been incredibly uh, popular. We went to the places where people rode. So the distributors uh, aren't really TAC. There are other riders who think, hey, this is a great idea. I'll give it to my friends and family. Bit of social media, mm -hmm. got the message out. And uh, we've now got demand from all around the world, um, other, other states, Italy, um, think great idea. It's simple, it's cheap. Let's go with it. That's great. That's great. And that notion of the nudge, right? I mean, it sort of opens up new territories to continue down that journey to do more things like that. Yeah. And it opens up an entirely new territory for you as well. That's uh, right. It's really exciting. Great. Yeah, it Thank is. Thank you. Um, and again, you bring up risk at the beginning, which I think is interesting. I'd love to, uh, you know, talk about that further. So hold on to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Losing your dog is a heartbreaking ordeal, which is why we created Pedigree Found, the free lost dog alert that moves faster than your dog without the cost or complexity of a GPS tag. You just register your dog with Found, and then, if they ever go missing, you simply push one button. Within seconds, Thousands of lost dog alerts are posted across mobile ads in a two and a half kilometer radius, activating an army of scouts that will get your dog home safely and quickly. Missing dog posters and neighborhood flyers have long been the way to let locals know you've lost your pooch. Now a new smartphone app aims to do the same thing. So this technology is really uh, world first in terms of utilizing our Google Display Network as well as Dynamic Creative to deliver a real-time message in a very finite location and using geolocation targeting. It's the first of its kind globally and we're hoping it's just the start of many more to come. This goes way beyond just creating an app. Working with Google, we've developed a new way to use display advertising that can combine uh, the buying power of Mars with real-time geotargeted communications to help solve deeply personal, localized problems. So thanks to Pedigree Found, your dog won't stay lost for long. Pedigree found. The lost dog alert that moves faster than your dog. How many people have pets here? Cats, dogs? So you instantly get this, right? I mean, it's just, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and the results, every, you know, when I see those results, it just initially, they sort of blow my mind, right? The uptake is amazing. And more interesting is how that this is outside of a particular product, yeah? And, and this is where, you know, getting into doing good beyond, you know, just driving sales and, you know, bringing something special into people's lives, you know, like a good product, is, is really magical because we're, we're actually surrounding entire, entire communities with this and doing something completely different. And I'm not going to talk anymore because, you know, I, I, I get excited about seeing, seeing those things. So can you take us through this a little bit more, Debbie? I can indeed. Um Given this, as you know, is a campaign that we are so, so proud of for actually a variety of reasons. Um, you, you sort of talk to it, there's so many pet owners here and really it delivers to um, that universal fear that any pet owner, any dog owner has of losing your dog. Um, so it, it delivers to the purpose that we have in Mars Pet Care, which is um, making the world a better, a better place for pets, a better place for dogs. It also delivers to our brand belief as well, which is feeding the good that dogs bring to the world. Um, so that's what makes me really excited. But the other piece is, this is not a one-off wonder, it's not a one-off idea. And this is the latest 
creativity, the latest innovation that we've had over a period of years and for pedigree and in New Zealand. And for me, it's that evolution of an amazing creative relationship with our agency, Clenzo BBDO, and their absolute passion and understanding of our brand and knowing that we're also always open to new ideas. I think the piece for me in terms of that creativity and innovation is traditionally we, in past years, we've been very wedded to a business challenge and presenting the brief to the agency um, and saying this is the business challenge and here's the brief and don't sort of deviate from that. And it meant that we weren't open to new ideas when they came along. So by having an open brief, the agency have been looking for ways to bring our brand belief to life. Um, and this is found as actually the evolution and the result of, of that relationship and that openness of Mars to actually take on board and evaluate any new idea. The other piece that I'm really proud of is that actually it was a data insight that we had presented to us from Google and Zoo around the technological breakthrough of being able to um, serve um, an alert ad on the Google Display Network down from about 15 minutes to, a, to instantly. And that was presented to Clenzo, and the guys actually looked at actually how can they use this data point to, to bring it to life. And thankfully, they thought of pedigree, and they had the universal insight around the fear of losing dogs, and they brought the idea to us. And because we're so open and we didn't have the set brief, we were open to taking a risk. You talk about risk, and that's something that we've been working on really closely in the New Zealand market um, around trying new things. And actually, this is the evolution, and this was an easy yes. We mm. fell in love with it. That's great. That's great. Um, a couple things there, which I, I find interesting. The Google Display Ad Network, I mean, it's been with us 15 you know, years now. It's not a technology that's brand spanking new. It's not a Snapchat that, you know, Drinkwise was able to harness uh, for their initiative. It's something that surrounds us. It's something that we literally forget about, you know, just because it's part and parcel of our, our day as we browse our mobile device, as we're on our computers, ads are being served to us. It's practically invisible. And in a lot of ways, that sort of makes it more magical, right? Because it's reliable. It's always on. It's ever present. We don't think about it. And so being able to think about combining technologies that we've come to just not even know is there because they're ever present is something that is really wonderful, right? It's something that you know really can change the game. It doesn't always have to be the next shiny new thing. It can be those things that um, you know we can resuscitate or bring back into uh, focus because they add value to us without us even knowing it. And that's that's really amazing. And you also talk about. Um, a little bit of sustainability, right? I mean, this notion of this isn't something that's going away. And I want you to hold on to that, and I think you guys can all relate to this. This is something that we should bring up because, again, moving away from what traditionally we think of as campaign thinking, what does the new advertising look like? Why does it need to go away? So hold on to that because we'll come back to it after, uh, after we have a chance to see Visit Victoria and hoping videos work this time. How do you show off a city's hidden secrets and let people go before they go? You make a game of it using Periscope, a game called Play Melbourne Live. We are live. Welcome to the scope. We created a ball that puts a live Periscope stream in the hands of real Melburnians to tell the most authentic stories of our city. In this game, the whole city is the field and everyone in it, the players. The goal? Go from one side of our city to the next, passing the ball, answering your questions and collecting as many stories as possible. Since our ball looked nothing like a phone or a video camera, curious locals, the kinds you'd want as your tour guides, embraced the games. We visited local designers, gained secret access to one of our most historic places, we are here for the Andy Warhol and I Weiwei exhibition at the National Gallery of Victoria. 
I love this. We're talking to the world through a globe. Isn't it fantastic? Phenomenal. Even got a song written while being guided through one of our most famous laneways. With each game, our followers and engagement has grown. Even the inventor of Periscope got excited about our new use of this new platform. With many games to come in 2016, we've made our ball design open source, so anyone can download it, make their own with simple materials, and bring us their own Periscope stories from wherever they live. Talk to us a little bit about you know what the genesis was here because I know you're no stranger to sort of you know prototyping and trying some new things and experimenting within your organization, but this is really something special. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you guys got to the insight or the you know the the, the initiative here. Sure. Um, the, this Periscope campaign is actually the uh, I guess part of an evolution of a longer term campaign, um, Play Melbourne. Um, Play Melbourne dates back quite a few years now and I guess the evolution or part of the evolution of Play Melbourne was research that showed that um, many of our, our core target markets, especially people from Sydney and Brisbane, um, had, had travelled to Melbourne and there was sort of a, a thought that they'd, they'd seen everything that Melbourne had to offer. Um, so we came up um, originally three years ago with a remote control tourist campaign with Clemengers which was essentially strapping cameras on the heads of a number of tourists um, and having them live over five days, eight hours a day, um, walking around Melbourne, interacting with Melbourne, engaging with Melbourne experiences and passionate people uh, and actually guided by uh, social media to, to see how they interacted with Melbourne. Um, that was screened live to the world um, and I guess in terms of risk and uh, <laughs> that sort of thing from a state government organisation, that was a massive undertaking and it needed a lot of um, research behind it um, and a lot of calculated risk, but the whole, especially the element that we were live to the world. Uh, so fast forward that to last year where again working with Clemengers and looking at the latest evolution of Play Melbourne, um, we saw Periscope as a, as a great vehicle to actually again tap into that that ability to engage live with an audience um, and interact with Melbourne and show those experiences, those passionate people and using our host Adam and a, a novel concept of using a ball so rather than just having an iPhone, actually having this innovative ball um, using with the camera inside it uh, as, a, as part of the campaign and using that to in interview and, and inter interact with Melbourne um, and, and show unique experiences along the way um, in a series of games and broadcasts that we um, promoted through social media and, and also use it, I guess, to collect content along the way. So we, we actually use that content um, to obviously show live but also capture that content to show on YouTube and, and, and throughout our other digital channels and social media. That's great. This notion of uh, reuse, right? And harnessing all that, the sort of byproducts of all the things you do rather than exactly. just expecting that it's just going to, you know, sort of flow and go away, but really being able to take that efficiency, right? And that's, that's exciting. Yeah. Now, the evolution of this um, coming off the back of remote controlled tourists, you know, is there one singular sort of insight that's driving all of that? Or, you know, what was, what was the genesis of sort of this turning, you know, turning the, the, um, uh, the, the formula inside out so it's not about driving people to go see something, but it's about broadcasting to the world the experience of people in Melbourne. Like, is that something that started with remote control tourists? Is that something that really started to come out in this campaign or initiative? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it has evolved from the, the initial concept behind remote control tourists was the, the ability to show someone, to allow them to go before they go. Um, you could have done that with some pre-recorded video, but the ability to show it live just gave it a whole new element um, and obviously a whole new level of risk, uh, but at the same time, a whole new element to show you this is what's happening now in Melbourne as we speak, it's going live. Um, 
So with the remote control tourists, obviously that was something that we could do for five days and that was it, budget said we can't go any further. But with Periscope, suddenly you've got this tool that is a vehicle that is, you know, we can tap into at any point. Uh, it's something that anyone can download and use. Um, and it, it's interesting that Kayvon was, the, one of the founders was mentioned there. Um, Kayvon himself has, has quoted that the remote control tourist was one of his inspirations mm -hmm. for Periscope. Um, oh, it, when he was, it was in its infancy when remote control tourist was there and he saw that as, hey, this thing can work because these guys are doing it. And, and then he's actually to see that it's come full circle and Play Melbourne is now using Periscope. Uh, he loves it, that's it's great. fantastic. That's amazing. Um, one of the things I really love is this, the end there was that bit about open sourcing the ball so anybody could download it. How has that been received? Are people using it? Uh, I don't know the, the stats on how many people have actually downloaded the ball, but um, would, I guess we'd love to see some, some more out there and, and floating around Melbourne. Yeah, I love, I love just being able to, you know, sort of take the things that you create and make it available to everybody, you know, and being generous in that way. It, it speaks volumes about what you're trying to do and how you're encouraging people to have their own experiences, yeah. right? And it's not always just about Melbourne necessarily. It's about letting people take that into their, their own worlds and, and start to broadcast and share. And that's really, that's really powerful. Um, all right, down to brass, brass tacks. We've got about, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. Um, you know, we want to reserve some time for questions. We've sort of gone through the introductions. You sort of know all these folks and what they're about and why they're in front of you today. Um, I want to start diving in a little bit more into some of these things I asked them to hold dear. Um, let's start with risk. Okay. This is probably one of the biggest challenges facing every single one of us here, every single one of us in the room who does any sort of this, any of this type of work. If you're in, within an organization trying to make, you know, make change, if you're uh, trying to push boundaries, if you are not seeing you know, the sort of performance within your own company and you're trying to push boundaries, there's always that step, there's always risk. And it's not just risk at the beginning, it's risk throughout. Um, and typically risk manifests in a way where it's all or nothing. And you know, technology and new ways of thinking and new ways of working are allowing us to minimize risk and hopefully take the organization along the journey so that they're not freaking out or they're not saying no. And I think that you know, with all of these examples we've seen, each and every one of them start with risk. You've had to appeal to your, you know, the powers that be, your organizations, to take a leap of faith, I think I heard somebody say, to you know, try, to try something different, because honestly, different is the only thing that would have gotten you to where you've gone. Otherwise, you'd be in this, this constant swirl and eddy of the same old, and you probably you know, uh, wouldn't be able to you know, move the needle on your business or what, you know, what matters to your organizations. The other interesting thing is the variety of organizations we have up here who are all facing similar types of risk. So government, travel and tourism, you know, um, big brand, global brands, like this is something that is prevalent with, within every, every endeavor we embark on when it comes to innovation. So who's first? Who wants to talk about risk first and what it's meant to you and your organization? Because I think it's also, I, I, the one, on one hand very personal because it's like, gosh, I've got to take a leap of faith myself. But you also have to, you know, find the, the sort of courage and the wherewithal to fight the good fight internally and turn the tide in terms of the people that you're, you know, getting either funding from or support from. Um, would you like to start, Debbie? I can definitely start. This is a topic that's very dear to my heart. <laughs> um, so I work for Mars New Zealand, and just to sort of set the scene, um, we're a multi-sales unit, so I... I head up marketing for pet care, but we also have food and we also have chocolate. So we're all competing for limited resources within the business. And we also have a, a mantra that, you know, fewer, bigger, better. So we want to put a lot of our resources and our emphasis and our focus on the activities that are going to drive growth. So, but they have to be the right activities. So you can throw the kitchen sink at something and unless you know you have a pretty good feeling that this is gonna be what drives growth, you know, you can fail spectacularly. And that's okay. You know, I have to say, um, when we talk about risk, you also have to talk about it's okay to fail. Now, don't do the same thing twice. 
Um, but learn, learn from your successes, learn from your failures. And I have the privilege to work in an organisation where I'm given responsibility for my portfolio and that comes with taking risk, owning that portfolio, taking risk. But we have also embraced what we call the test and learn culture. So 90% of my budget goes into the everyday. So it's about driving that business forward. 10% is about the over and above. That's the test and learn part. Like, come up with, don't just test one thing. If you've got three or four um, ideas and you think they've got legs, what we're trying to do is minimise the risk to know where to throw the kitchen sink. So it's test small, be fast, be agile, make it happen, learn from it, learn failure, and success, and trust me, I've had my fair share of failures, but I've also had my fair share of successes. Um, and scale up fast, where you've got those successes, and that's what we talk about, minimising risk. Um, and what you saw with Pedigree Found, now that actually was a test and learn for us. So we had this phenomenal idea, um, and we loved it, but we only launched it in Greater Auckland, which is a quarter of the New Zealand population, so you know, it's a feeling good representation. But we were able to activate really quickly, get the results, and when I talk about scale up, that's not just for New Zealand. Mm. The great thing is, because of our track record, we've actually earned the right to take risks globally. And we're getting support from Global to invest in some of these things that we're doing. So we've taken the risk, earned the respect, um, so we are now looking at scaling up this particular campaign into other, other units. Um, and one of the things you talk about risk is taking those learnings and the whole, and this probably leads to your sustainability as well, is around doing the thinking up front so that you actually streamline it, you have the right conversations, so it's also easily scaled up so it enables the other units not to minimise their risk as well. That's great. That's great. Um, and is it so? Is is something like found and the the risks you take that have been successes? Do they send a ripple effect through the entire organisation? Is this something that you now you know are able to share that knowledge and other regions or markets around the world are starting to embrace? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's certainly a focus for Mars globally to be more entrepreneurial, to be more agile, um, and I think it's great, you know, we are seen as a bit of an innovator, a bit of, a, bit of an incubator for the Mars mm. environment, and I think also it's like dipping, dipping your toe in and you get success, and you can share that success and energise. So absolutely, I've been share sharing this with the region. Um, certainly, there has been some focus from Global. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what actually I see is, is actually this flows through within the organisation as well. Because to my mind, innovation is not solely um, the purview of marketing. Innovation, it's a mindset. Mm. And what we're doing, we've led it, we've led the charge in New Zealand from the marketing team because we completely embrace this. But we're actually sharing this with the wider business because every functional area can innovate. And so it's a mindset. Okay, one last question. And you know, I'm gonna ask you all this because I think it's important. But um, now that you've taken risk, now that you've you know, sort of gotten over the gate, so to speak, or through the gate, is it easier? Is it harder? Do you want, are you, do you hunger for it? Um, really good question. Um, absolutely, I, I think it's what I absolutely thrive on now. Um, it's funny, I was just actually chatting to some people this morning and it's about actually colouring outside of the lines and it's okay. And sometimes you do things and ask for forgiveness later. I'm not saying I do that all the time, but sometimes it's actually just changing the status quo and you know, it kind of, I've got my day job and I'm passionate about it, but these, what I call the over and above, the mm. fun things, this is what I really mm. get out of bed for. Mm. And the more I take risk and put myself in an uncomfortable position, I, I just love it. It's, it's you know, it, the passion is there. Yes, yeah. I can see it, it's great, <laughs> it's awesome. All right, John, CEO, right? You know, 
in some ways the buck stops with you, right? In other ways, you've got you know, a big board to appeal to. Um, so with risk, what is that about with your, within your organization and with this particular initiative, how did risk play out? Was it something you were able to minimize? How did you get it over the line? Yeah. I think, um, Gavin, one of the things with how to drink properly and going into that campaign and recognizing that in many ways, as I alluded to before, you know, 20 years of government campaigns, we hadn't sh seen the dial shift at all. And I think born out of that comes a frustration, comes a realization that we could do a campaign that does the same old things and tries to bring about behavior change. Mm -hmm. It's probably not gonna work. So I think then the ability to go out and understand the audience in much better ways than we previously knew allows you as an executive to take that knowledge to the board because so much of all our organizations are dealing with our masters at a board level um, or an organizational level and getting their mindset around risk and what that means for them. So look, going into that cam campaign two weeks out, we still had a divided board in many ways. Wow. You know, looking at some of the language in the campaign, um, recognizing that at a board level, who were used to seeing above the line TVC campaigns that they could say, that's us, we're doing our job. This was gonna be a very social campaign that for many of them, they weren't going to see it. So managing those expectations around what the campaign would deliver, but also the, the confidence that we knew the research was right. We knew that the target audience got the message and we knew that the different tactics that we were going to use were actually going to resonate with them, was, gave us a lot of confidence to take risk. So I guess the key message coming out for us is that we have fundamentally changed as an organization, wow. but it's only come about because we were prepared to provide the board with the evidence that, that this was working and that we, for the first time, were, do, were actually playing in the space, um, in the behavior change, change space, knowing it was going to work. So sometimes I think we think about risk as, you know, taking that leap of faith, you know, coming up with a great idea and just running with it. In this case, it's very much a calculated risk calculation for us, making sure we've, we've ticked all those boxes, which sounds very sanitary, mm. but I think in our case, dealing with such a big issue that was going to divide people outside of the, the, the age cohort of 18 to 24 year olds, um, and perhaps be quite controversial, um, we needed to have that, that confidence. That's great, and so now that you're through the looking glass, so to speak, you're on the other side, does the board feel more comfortable? Do you feel more confident taking risk? Is it something you want to do, or was it one of those sort of melees that left you a little? I think organizationally we've been thinking about that. We, we now recognize that we, we can't go back. Mm. You know, we've set a certain standard mm. amongst ourselves that we're a, an innovative organization. We do things differently. And I think that's provided us with a niche. Um, some people don't like that. Um, but I think for us, it's, it's garnered us with a certain way of looking at the world. And I don't think for our future campaigns and what we do, we'll be doing the things we did seven, eight years ago. It's fundamentally changed how we consider ourselves as an organization. And importantly, that's also infiltrated through to the board. They also see themselves as highly innovative. They're all patting themselves on the back now. They came up with the idea, um, not the CLEMS team. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's interesting how success, when you do take a risk, as Debbie was alluding to, can really infiltrate the whole organization. Mm. And it, it just changes um, the perception both from outside stakeholders, but also internally. Great, great. All right, Mike. So, you are, a dig as, as a digital leader within your organization, you know, risk is something that you probably had to fight most of your career, right? I mean, I, I, I'm similar, you know, I feel like you're always beating your head against the wall when it comes to being digital. It's always a, a you're trying to fight the good fight um, and you're trying to demonstrate why it's important to try new things with new technologies, but at the same time, you know, you just can't go whole hog, right? And it seems like you, through your career and through a lot of your efforts, have learned to 
find interesting ways to minimize risk and be able to, to take it so it's, it's either bite-sized or palatable for folks. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with risk within your organization and how it's, you know, it's either helped or hindered? Yeah, sure. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite words um, in the digital environment is, is pilot. Uh, I, I love running a pilot. Um, it, it kind of allows us to use, a, a, I guess, a smaller budget to run a pilot on a new, whether it's a, a new mobile application um, or something like a, a Periscope or, or a social media ac activation, um, something that if we, we call it a pilot, it means we're, we're going to test it on, a, I guess, a smaller market, a smaller budget, and with the, the proviso that, hey, it can fail, and we open it to this is, this is risky and it, it has a chance to fail. So um, I, I think, again, we've talked about calculated risk um, and, ha and being able to test, learn, test, um, research, and, and I guess our remote controlled tourist campaign and also the more recent Periscope campaign has, they're both very risky. Um, in a way, our Periscope campaign was easier to get across the line because remote controlled tourists had led the way um, and there were people that put their jobs on the line for that campaign just because things that it was live mm -hmm. and people were, well, what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so there was a, a massive risk register. We tried to find out exactly what every single possible thing that could happen um, from aliens landing through to people kidnapping the actual cameras, etc. Everything was covered off so that our stakeholders are right, what about this? okay, we've got an answer for that. What about this? We've got an answer for that. Uh, so that, again, that calculated risk, then we ran, it, it was tested and tested over and over again. Mm. Um, so I guess the risk continued, was minimized, minimized as much as possible. Mm. It was still there, but the stakeholders said, okay, we can see that you've put a lot into this and we can we'll give the tick and, and go ahead. Um, so uh, again, you know, put a lot on, on test on learn and evolve and grow. That's great. So with this notion of, um, you know, now that you're through the risk, you know, your organization, it seems like just the things you've done over time, you've almost prepared yourself in the organization for what this means moving forward and that it, you, you will take risks now and moving forward and even in the past. Is your, are you comfortable, would you say, with constant risk or taking these risks with every campaign? Or is it, you know, like Debbie says, sort of ch picking and choosing battles? Um, and how does your organization sort of respond to these things when you, when you bring it to them? Do they feel more comfortable? Uh, I think it's, it's definitely a case of picking your battles. Um, I think it's not a, it's not a, a case of, of constantly throwing out um, new projects and over and over again. I, I think, you know, we have to pick and choose there's probably a few that have been left on the drawing board just because they are either too risky, they didn't have enough budget to actually, you know, measure that risk, or we had to move on to something else. So I guess um, it's a, it's again back to that calculated risk mm -hmm. and picking and choosing which innovative projects we can see have a future. Um, I know in the mobile space, which we identified for tourism very early on in the in the piece. You know, we, we built a, our first mobile site 10 years ago wow. um, to test the market and learn. Um, we might have had five people actually visit it, but, <laughs> but we, we learned from it um, and that evolved into our, our current mobile site. So it's that sort of, it's the willingness to put up a project that might not have a massive target market because they're not actually there yet, um, but to actually learn from the technology, learn from the innovation take a risk that's actually minimized by the fact that it's not going global at that very point uh, and then roll it out. Yeah, I love, I love that notion of having you having done that over a very long period of time. It's almost like you've socialized risk a little bit, right? Uh, and that's, that's really interesting and something I think um, a lot of us could probably take to heart, yeah? Um, okay, Sam, you're up. Risk within your organization, knowing that it's, you know, it's a government organization um, how was risk received? Were you able to find ways to minimize it? Was it something that was hard to get over the line? Well, I think as an organization, the TAC is actually considered quite an innovative organization. And 
the biggest risk for us was taking a brand that was incredibly well known, um, a campaign style that was uh, very well known, very well accepted, not just in Victoria, but in fact internationally. The way you do public education in road safety is pretty much how TAC does it. We created it, we're it. So taking the risk to change all that, it was huge because you really don't have a pilot or a testing environment. Um, you can do a little bit of it, but eventually you have to launch the whole of the Victorian community. So we have a, a lot of barriers in, in some senses. You know, we, we are government, we have a board, we have management, um, and all of them tend to be pretty risk averse. <laughs> but I think what really got everybody over the line is saying, we're not going to be able to reduce the number of people killed on our roads unless we do something different. Um, fortunately, the, the, the first campaign we launched was incredibly successful um, and the community really got on board and there might have been a bit of this TAC man that we're aiming for zero, but the campaign itself worked incredibly well and um, was produced incredibly well. So that was great can we continue on the journey? Because the sorts of, uh, I suppose, criticisms, the sort of feedback, you know, we're getting over this journey of a change in style is, well, TAC's gone soft. You had a very hard hitting, in your face style, the reality of road trauma being brought to everybody's home week in, week out. You know, this is soft approach. Do you really expect it to work? So, you know, it's, it is, it's fairly risky and, the only way we can really work through it is using the evidence base that we have about what is going to work and that the Victorian community really is ready for change. So do you feel more comfortable now with risk now that something like this is out in the world? Do you, are you eager for it? Do you want to go back to that well? <laughs> I think personally, um, I was ready for it quite a while ago. Um, yeah, and I think that this sort of combination of um, community uh, acceptance, but also us being able to do a little bit of things like the writer reminder, the, the nudge sort of campaigns that aren't quite as in your face as say a, a TVC, um, and, and a bit of um, social and online work too that, that starts to take risk. Um, just actually gives me confidence a little bit, but also, um, you know, the people who, who like to be risk averse in, in our organisation and um, further afield, that we can do it, mm. that it's okay, we, we can take these risks and, and the world won't fall over. That's great. Um, I want to move on now to a topic um, that speaks to the longevity of these ideas and how they sort of carry through, right? This notion of sustainability and moving away from just campaign thinking. Not to say campaigns are dead, not to say campaigns are going away, but we've created, you know, all of, you know, all of our panelists have created things that either pivot into new territory or are entirely new, you know, product or service. Um, and these things shouldn't go away. We shouldn't treat them as a six month, you know, initiative. Um, and I wonder for y all of you, was that something that was in the cards? Was that something that was considered early on? Is it only now that you might be thinking about, oh wow, we, we have this uh, platform now to evolve, grow, and continuously you know, learn from and, you know, um, and expand into? Um, and how does that impact your thinking around campaigning and the usual trend of you know, going out to market as a marketing camp you know, initiative or campaign? Um, why don't we start at the other end? You want to uh, you want to pick that up, Sam? Uh, I, I think for us, um, we're, we're always in market, so we've always th that idea that you're continuing to evolve. I think what uh, moving you know to a change in the way we do things has done for us, though, is how we go about it. So continuing. Um, now, rather than innovation being something that we do, rather than innovative is the way we are, is really yeah. where we've moved to. Okay. And we're now continuing to look for ways other than a TVC um, to, to get our message across and to talk to people and bring them along on our journey. And so I think it, 
it's not um, so much the overall idea that we're con continuing to look back how we go about it has changed. That's a great point. That's a good point. Mike? Um, sustainability is uh, crucial to, uh, I guess, a lot of our innovation projects and, and campaigns in general. Uh, Often if we're you know, spending a sizable amount of, of government money, we need to be shown to be how much we're using that and how much we're, uh, I guess, pushing that money as far as we can. Uh, in the, with our Periscope Play Melbourne campaign, for example, um, it's, we're, we're filming the filming, so to speak, so we're, we're capturing additional footage, imagery, video, um, throughout each of our broadcasts packaging that and repackaging that into social media, into video that goes up onto YouTube, gets promoted across our site. Um, so I guess the, the use of all of our channels, making sure it cr cuts across all of our digital channels um, to, I guess, expand and, and grow that, um, that actual message and, and the key elements of that campaign so that Post-campaign, we've still got these amazing assets, imagery, video that we can continue to use and, and push out through through social media and, and our website um, for months to come rather than that defined campaign period. Uh, the, the same in terms of the way we evolve our innovation. Um, we don't just build a website or build a mobile site. It's continued, sustained innovation so that it, it grows and changes with time. Um, even our mobile site, for example, adding a feature that allows people to use location based to, to search for nearby accommodation or restaurants or bars, etc. And just those, those little steps along the way to sustain that mobile site and to provide, I guess, more, more information to the to visitor when they're, they're on the ground. Hey, um, I want to hover there for a second. There's something really interesting in what you said around you know, the way you're cutting and capturing and you know, re repackaging content. You know, it's almost an evolution of the marketing department in a, in a way. Um, and, it, and is that something that you're conscious of, or is this something that you know has just sort of happened serendipitously as a way of you know understanding or reaching your audience? Are you guys conscious that you're literally moving into the direction of being able to take content, know that it can be repurposed, know that it can be you know uh, instrumental? in reaching an audience without sort of going back to a brief or back to another you know, initiative to then roll out to the world, but having almost a, a team that's constantly taking what's available to them and repackaging it and repurposing that. Is that, is that conscious? It, it's, it's definitely conscious from the, I guess, all the very early stages of, of those types of campaigns. Uh, it, it's how, how we can take that that budget and that, and that money that we've been provided with to run the campaign and, and how we can leverage that uh, and content creation is very very key for for us in terms of the way we what the way we use it and how we have pushed that out through I mean our social channels themselves are a voracious um, <laughs> have a voracious appetite for content it's endless yeah. um, so the more the more that we can use our, our campaigns for example to to provide new and original content to push through those social channels, the better. So it's definitely a conscious decision at the at the very forefront. That's great. That's great. And do you feel like your team is pretty well equipped to stay on top and abreast of you know how that stuff needs to you know be packaged and put out in the world? Do you have operational sort of you know um, approach where you know you've got calendars in place to deliver all that stuff? Um, it, it's definitely, again, in terms of evolving, it's definitely something that's evolving and, and I think it will continue to evolve our, I guess our, our, our social media team, for example, will, will evolve to, to include more production, mm -hmm. if anything, um, in terms of reusing and reusing those snippets of video content, for example, and, and cutting and recutting into 15 second grabs to, to push out through Twitter or Instagram, for example. Um, I think that is a, an evolution of of a, of a social media team to have more of that production element. Mm, that's great. Okay, John. What about now that you've had that you know sort of those key insights, and you've moved into this you know sort of new territory. You've reached a, you know a very difficult audience in a different way. Um, how is that now sustainable in your eyes? Is that something that you know? Is it always looking to the next channel that you know, 18 to 24-year-olds are you know are gathering around? Is it you know, 
evolving the, the, the message to be more inclusive of other channels? Like, how do you think about evolution in terms of what, um, you know, what you've done with DrinkWise? Yeah, and look, Devon, I, I think five years ago, if you were an 18-year-old, the message that you got from government was, don't turn a night out into a nightmare. Mm. Compelling stuff. Um, <laughs> now, the message that you'll receive from how to drink properly is drink classy bitches, or sober can be classy, but a vomit beard cannot. You know, we've, we've fundamentally changed the messages that an 18 year old who is drinking excessively is getting, and those messages are about moderation. But they're couched in a way, um, in a tone, in a flavor through comedy, but also in a very realistic mm. portrayal of what they're experiencing every Friday and Saturday night. So for us, the tactics that we've used, you know, from initially going and looking at YouTube pre-rolls while they're, they're pre-loading to, to Spotify, to, mm. to Facebook, to now start looking at geo-targeting through Facebook when we know they're drinking, um, using Snapchat, um, using a whole range of devices. We've learned along the way different platforms, um, different ways to find 18 to 24 year olds, and that's constantly evolving. So for us, part of the learning has been we've, we've got to stay a step ahead. We've got to um, be on the ground. We've got to understand 18 to 24 year olds. And that, look, they're really hard to understand. You know, they're living life in high definition. They're <laughs> always on. Um, they're so savvy when it comes to marketing. And I think the real lesson for us is the moment we get it wrong, they're telling us. Um, and mm. we're kind of getting beaten down because we, we stuffed up, but it's great in terms of learning. And I think that's, that's really exciting for us because we're getting instant feedback. But when we're putting out pieces of creative that they love, they're sharing it, they're tagging it, they're, you know, they're really getting into it. And it's those insights that we get through the creative team combined with you know, these new tactics and new ways to reach them that's really exciting and I think that continues to evolve. And I think we also feel almost a sense of, of ownership that we're, we've started on a journey of a moderation message for 18 to 24 year olds. You know, this campaign's got a lot of life left in it because you know, Drinkwise as an organization is just one player in this space. You know, we can't claim that we're changing the drinking culture by ourselves. Mm. We have to acknowledge that there's other players, there's other restrictions, there's lockout laws, there's everything going on. But I think perhaps we're at the organization that's actually speaking to them in their language, in the tone that they want to be spoken to, um, and they're getting it. And they're providing us with, with feedback that suggests that they're getting it. So really gratifying. That's great. There's a couple things that I want to hover on for a moment. Um, this dynamic feedback loop you talk about and actually listening and not just telling or scolding or saying what needs to happen is really, really interesting. And it's sort of, you know, when you talk about, at first you talked about the insight early on about how um, 18 to 24 year olds lived and how they, you know, and what they did and what mattered to them when it came to those big nights out and drinking. Um, but you did talk much about the, you know, the channels in terms of, you, you know, you knew Snapchat was, you know, was important or it could be an, an important clue. But listening through those channels is something that, that's a huge insight in and of itself. It's not just, hey, we can push these messages through great channels that, you know, the youth of today or 18 to 24 year olds are constantly on. It's, we have to be present in that and we can't walk away from it and it's this sort of conversation through behavioral or reaction that we need to be able to harness, which I feel is re really fascinating. And has that changed you know, your department or marketing team or the way you go out to the world to, you know, like is the first thing now, you know, when you, when you sit down, are you looking at a dashboard? Are you seeing comments? Has is that, is that changed your habit in order to you know, better understand and continuously learn from your organization or your, your our audience? Yeah, look, absolutely. So, you know, traditional market research and tracking, you know, that still takes place. But, you know, our marketing director has been fantastic in working with media buying agencies and CLEMS in terms of understanding the feedback that's constantly coming in and changing the tactics accordingly. So, you know, some things we've, we've moved on from, some things we're dialing up. And I think, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a new way of working that's completely great. when you start taking those feedback. 
in, you know, on a weekly basis and, and thinking tactically about what you're doing going into the future. You said earlier, uh, just a minute before too, um, that the campaign has a lot of life left in it. Does that sort of beget the conversation around a platform that doesn't necessarily go away, that might have beats or pulses but is always sort of present? Yeah, I, look, I think we've got a real, um, we've got a real obligation to keep this going. I think one of the, the benefits of Drinkwise as opposed to government campaigns which are limited by budgets or political timelines, you know, Drinkwise has a, you know, a 20-year mandate to try and change the drinking culture. You know, it's going to be a big task. Uh, we're 10 years into the journey mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot of changes in other age groups for a whole range of reasons, some of which perhaps has been Drinkwise's campaign. But I think for that 18 to 24 year old age group, they you know, that rite of passage that, you know, becoming an adult and the role of alcohol in their lives, you know, that's not gonna change. You know, you've got 16 year olds now coming into that age group um, with the expectation that you drink excessively, you drink to get drunk, it's part of becoming an adult. Mm. Um, so that sense that the campaign's got a lot of life, we've always got a new cohort coming through um, as long as the message is still resonating about, hey, you can, you can drink responsibly and still have a good time. You can, you can dial it back a bit. You can use all these tactics to do that in a, obviously, a, a very uh, colorful way. Um, we think is probably the way to go. That's great. Yeah. Cool, thank you. All right, Debbie, what about you? And, you know, sustainability. I mean, there's so many potential directions for something like Found to go, yeah. you know, because, it really do, does defy what we think of in terms of marketing, but yet it can still be a marketing vehicle. It's a utility, it's, it's a lot of different things. And I know it probably is difficult to sort of wrap the, you know, the collective mind around it to say where to next, but you know, how do you see this evolving? How do you see it as a sustainable platform? Good question. <laughs> um, I think if I step back, and I talked a little bit earlier around the fact that actually found is a product of the evolution or the journey that we've actually been on mm. for the Pedigree brand. And, you know, it's a global brand. You know, here's a little plug. It's, you know, the largest pet food brand in the world. It's, it's big. So as a global marketing company, we also have global creative comms. We have a brand belief and we use those as well. So it's the amplification, the over and above mm of the innovative projects that we're doing that are the evolution. How do we actually bring that brand belief to life and make it relevant and current and recent, but not sort of just popping them out there and then just letting them fly. So to me, found is something that we are really committed to um, and is, is continuing to be live. Um, but we are also looking at other ways that we can evolve the brand message going forward as well in terms of innovation. Hmm. But if I think also about sustainability um, and learning, it's also about actually practice makes perfect. So we've actually been on a really fantastic journey, um, Mars New Zealand and our creative agency, and we've evolved this wonderful relationship that is an open brief and they come to us with new ideas and we evolve that. Now, we've done that really successfully with, with Pedigree over a number of years, but we've got 20 brands in our stable mm. um, across all three segments. Actually, we need to be bringing mm. that process and that thinking to mm. some of our other brands um, because, hey, I have to say, I have the luxury of knowing that we have a lot of innovative ideas in our little, you know, funnel um, for pedigree. So we're, we're, we're well sorted there and we will continue to evolve. But it's actually how do we bring that, mm. that approach and that thinking to our other brands um, because we know that that's actually a success model. That's actually an amazing point. You know, we look at these campaigns as, you know, the, the tip of the spear. 
but really what's behind it is how do you bring that sort of thinking, that sustainable notion to the rest of the organization. And it doesn't just have to be through marketing, you know, specifically. Um, it can be through a whole host of experiences or just making the organization better at doing what it does to reach and connect with con their, its consumers and constituents. And that's, that's, a phenomenal, that's a phenomenal point. So within that, do you now see programs or how do you bucket, or like either bucket or wrap that up to be able to deliver that to other brands within the, yeah. the Mars family? Um, within Mars New Zealand, um, we, yeah, well, it, within Mars, we have kind of a Khan challenge. So, you know, um, thinking about new innovative work. And we've, we've had the luxury of this wonderful relationship with Pedigree and understanding it, and it's this massive pipeline of ideas. But we know that we need to stretch that. We need to stretch that across all three segments and we've got some amazing brands. So what we've been doing, and this is where the passion from the agency around our business, you know, we actually brief, put out a brief around this and welcome all the creatives to come along and, and pitch for them. And we had a phenomenal response last year right across all of our segments um, of something like 100 ideas. Mm. Um, and three quarters of them were amazing. Wow. So it's, it's actually that luxury of choices, mm -hmm. but we had to evolve to the point where we had that relationship and we actually had to learn and understand actually what works. Um, and that's internally for Mars mm. as well, um, in terms of being open to ideas. Um, and if there's passion and a kernel of an idea that is true to the brand, explore it further, be open to it, take a bit of risk. That's great. Yeah. All right, so we're starting to wrap up a little bit, and um, I know folks are probably heading out to lunch, so I want to um, ask one more question, and then we'll open it up to anybody else who wants to ask questions. Um, specifically, if in, I don't want to say a sentence, but you know, if you could, you know, provide a, an abbreviated bit of guidance, anything that you would say to anybody out there about, cr you know, being creative and innovative in, you know, in what you've done, and that, that advice that you would give to anyone who is in an organization or is looking to use creativity in, in innovative ways, what would you say? Let's start here. <laughs> okay. Um, what I would say is actually, Make yourself uncomfortable, put yourself out of your comfy slippers, and actually it's really easy to say no, um, mm. but actually really try to say yes. Wow, that's great. John? <laughs> um, I think the Drinkwise experience suggests to us is have confidence in your data, in your formative research, be emboldened by that, and go forth really because I think that gives you the confidence to take risk. Um, yeah, that would be the overarching message. Cool. Um, I guess from my experience, collaboration uh, is, is probably one of the, the keys to successful innovation, having everyone along for the ride. Um, that's working closely with our, our agencies, with our stakeholders, uh, our industry and our, and our team uh, at head office. I think having everyone together supporting an idea minimizes the risk in itself um, but also makes an innovative project a lot easier to have the full support of everyone you're working with rather than people for and against um, a risky idea great thank you i feel like uh, I, I just need a combination of the three of you but i think really that the clear insights that you start with um, and that you've got the whole team on board, both your creative team and your internal teams on board with what it is you're trying to achieve means that people will go that extra mile. And sometimes they will say no, but they'll say, no, that's not good enough. We can do better than mm -hmm. this and let's look for a different way of doing it. And I think that's what's actually uh, led us to really um, moving to the next step is being able to say, you know, we know what the insight is, we can do better with this. That's great. All of you, thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for these folks?